in Hebrews chapter 11 to start our class out. And we're studying these statements about faith in Hebrews chapter 11. Um, but actually there was something in chapter 10 that introduced it, and we'll see that in just a moment. In Hebrews chapter 11, it says in verse 1, it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. Well, we'll get into the, the fact there about uh, Abel and him bringing a more excellent sacrifice than Cain did and, uh, and some of the details that are there. But one of the things that we said two weeks ago that we need to kind of back up and look at again is what it says in verse 3 where it says, through faith we understand. And then as you start going through verse 11, or chapter 11, and you look at verse 4, it says, by faith Abel, verse 5, by faith Enoch, verse 7, by faith Noah, verse 8, by faith Abraham, uh, verse uh, 9, by faith he uh, sojourned. You start reading all about by faith. And there is a difference between verse 3, through faith, and those other verses that say by faith. And uh, it's a subtle difference, and in some cases it doesn't make a difference, but in other cases it, it, it does make a big difference. And I want you to understand this. When you look at verse 3, we have already studied for two weeks and understood that faith is believing what God said about a matter. That's what faith is. It's taking God at his word. That's why in your Bible, the faith is just, it just means what God said. And what we are to do is believe what God said. So that's why sometimes we talk about believing. Sometimes we say salvation's uh, through faith, and, and certainly it is. But God says some things, and that's faith. That's, that's what he says to us. That's what we are to believe. And then by faith, we believe what God said. Uh, in, these, in these verses here, through faith, it says in verse 3, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. And uh, that is, by what God said, we, we believe, or we know, or we understand how the worlds were framed. You'll notice that when it uses the word through faith, it's, re it's making a reference to uh, a way that you and I perceive and come to know something. And that is because God said so. That, that's how we can know it. And uh, we've talked about him as being a God that we can believe because he cannot lie, uh, and that he... He, there is evidence in the things that God said. Not only is he a witness of it, but everything points to it to be right. Uh, but it's through what he said and that we have an understanding. But then when you read verse 4 and it says, By faith Abel offered unto God. By faith, now Abel is acting out. There's through faith we understand, and then by faith we act on it. And there, there's a difference between those two things, through faith coming to understanding and then by faith acting out on it. I'd like you to compare two verses in Paul's epistles. Get Ephesians chapter 2, and at the same time, get uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 2 and 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Now, Ephesians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul is talking about our salvation. He's actually explaining why it is that God is saving us by grace today. And, uh, and I think that's extremely important. We touched on this on, uh, on Tuesday class, and being a smaller class, we could ask some questions and get everyone on the same uh, wavelength, but I'm not going to quite do the same thing. I want you to look at verse 6 of Ephesians chapter 2, and it says, And hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. God's purpose for saving us today and his purpose for seating us in heavenly places in Christ is so that in the ages to come, he's going to show something. And, uh, and I always relate this to an auto show. Uh, they'll be coming up in January where you can go down to uh, the... Uh, the Cobo Hall, yeah, and see the auto show. The auto show means they just take and they display their cars so people can see them in awe 
at uh, the different designs that they're coming out with and the different colors and the different uh, you know, interiors and just everything about a car, the best features that they could show, they put those cars there and, and people go to the auto show. Well, God's got a purpose for you and me, and it's the places in heavenly places in Christ, so that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of what? His grace. How rich in grace he is. <laughs> now, now, that is wonderful because God's going to show how rich in grace he is, but that means to show how rich in grace he is, grace has to do with undeserved, unmerited favor. How kind God is to save people like you and me who deserve to be in hell. That's what it means. There'll be no glory for us up there, only in the sense that we'll glory in God as well because of his grace toward us. We're glad we're there. And what, a, what, a, what an opportunity to be an example of God's grace. That God's going to show to the angelic hosts of heaven the exceeding riches of his grace toward us and, and of his kindness toward us because those angels know how little we deserve to be there. We're all sinners and we don't deserve eternal life and we deserve to be eternally damned and yet God through the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ took care of every last one of our sins. And even after we get saved, all the sins that we get, we've done after we're saved are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ so that when we get to heaven, we are going to be a trophy of God's grace. And that's why it says in verse 8, and I, I said all that just so you'd realize why it says this in verse 8, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God. For by grace, that's why we're saved by grace. If we weren't saved by grace, watch how these verses say this. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If salvation was through good works that we do, religious activities that we do and have fulfilled and, and achieved in our life, then we would be put in heaven and we'd be an example of our goodness and our efforts and our religious works and we would get the praise instead of God. But to make sure there is none of that, none of that is involved in your salvation. Your salvation is a gift that's received through faith, according to that verse. So that there is no boasting on any human person up there. The, all the glory goes to God because it's an extension of his grace. And that's why we're saved by grace. When God wanted to display himself and wanted people to know about his justice and his vengeance, he gave the world the law. And there in the law you see the justice of God and you see how God has to avenge evil and judge. But today God's purpose in grace is to show to the world his grace. And, and, and not just to show it now, but to show it in the ages to come by placing us there. Throughout the time God has done different things in different dispensations that he might reveal something about himself. And today he's revealing his grace. And so everything is by grace. Now, what I want you to see in the verse as well is not only is that salvation is by grace through faith, uh, and, and that faith has to do with the, the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, it says, for by grace are ye saved through faith. Now, it doesn't say, for by grace are ye saved by faith. And uh, I think it was back when I was writing Dictionary of the Gospel, I, I had said something about us being saved by faith, and if I'm right, it was uh, Dave Kasner who said, you know, the Bible says through faith. It doesn't quite say by faith. And I thought about what he was saying, and I looked at that, and I said, you know, you're, I, I'd be better off just putting the way the Bible says it. And now I'm really glad because there's something different between through faith and by faith. By faith, you act on something. Through faith, you come to understand something. And what God is, since salvation isn't a work, you're not acting on anything except this. That, that the only action that you do is an act of believing in the heart. You don't, you, don't ch you don't move a muscle in this body to be saved. What you do is through faith, that is through the message of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ and the perfect uh, salvation that he has supplied by dying in our behalf on that cross and being buried and rising again from the dead, that when we hear that message of truth that comes to us through faith, we just simply believe it and we're saved. Salvation is through faith. Now, that's how you're saved. But I want you to compare that to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 
And hopefully you realize something else in this world. There's a parenthesis, and we won't talk about what it's talking about before and after this. It has to do with uh, us being uh, uh, caught up with the Lord. But it says in verse 7, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, it says, For we walk by faith and not by sight. Now, we get saved through faith, right? We, God tells us a message, and we just believe that message, and God saves us. But how are we going to walk the Christian life? How are we going to live for the Lord? The thing, walk has to do with going through time, living our life, and conducting our, our, our way. How, how, what is going to be, how is it that we're going to live our life? What is the direction we're going to walk? What are the things that we're going to do and say? And, and what are we going to live for? Well, this verse says we walk by faith and not by sight. That is, the same thing, the message of God that's been given to us, now we're going to act on the things that we know that God would have us to do in life. He saved us apart from any works, no actions, just believing. But then after we believe it, after we are saved, now we're going to live our life a certain way, and what Paul is saying is we walk by faith. And that is, we take in the knowledge of what God would have us to do, what God would have us to say, how God would have us to conduct ourselves, and we begin to walk that way. And it's by that information that we go out and, and live for the Lord. I hope that you do both. I hope that you get saved through faith and that you learn to walk by faith. I think a lot of people get saved through faith and then they never learn to walk by faith. That is... To walk by faith is having enough knowledge of God's word that you know how to make a decision of what you should do and what you shouldn't do. What pleases God, what doesn't please God. How you ought to spend your time, even so-called free time, and how you ought to spend your employed time when you're at work. All this is told to you in the Bible, what God would desire you to do. And you could either, out of your own imagination, say, I think I should do this, or I think I should do that. And, and, uh, and, and then let, you know, if it's bad weather, oh, God doesn't want me to go to work today. Uh, because it's raining. That's sight. You could read in the Bible and you find out you're supposed to go to work even when it's raining. And, and then you could go by faith rather than by sight. So there's a difference between through faith and by faith. Through faith we understand something. And by faith we do something. Our salvation is through faith. Because it's not a work. It's believing what God said. When I said that there, there's something real close, come back with me now to, to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 3 first, because in our salvation, and th this is where they come real close, in our salvation, not only are we saved through faith, the Bible keeps saying we're justified by faith. <laughs> it, it's, it's both ways when it comes to salvation. You, you know, you're going to walk by faith, but, but here when Paul talks about in, in, the book of Ephesians, or in the book of Romans about us being saved, it says, like in verse 24, it says, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. That God declares us righteous. That's what being justified is, being declared righteous. We're declared righteous freely by God's grace. Well, how is it that he can declare a sinner righteous? Doesn't that make him a liar? No, he goes on to say, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Redemption has to do with paying the price, and the payment for sin is death, and Jesus Christ died for me and paid the price. If the price has been paid, then I don't have to pay it, so it can be free to me. And it is free to me, and, and I can be justified freely by God's grace. Now, when do I get justified? Well, look at verse 28. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. So we're justified by faith. Through faith we understand what Jesus Christ did for us and the grace of God that's been given toward us. And then all God wants us to do is by faith believe that and he'll declare us righteous. So it's even, we're saved through faith and justified at the same time by faith. Now you hear those two terms? Did this verse ever bother you? Come back to chapter 1 of Romans. And you might stick a paper in Romans chapter 3 because it'll be a long while but we'll be back. Romans chapter 1, it says this, it says uh, um, in verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, the good news of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that 
believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The good news of the gospel of our salvation, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for our sins, Paul said he's not ashamed of it because that's the power of God to save. Believing that message, it's got the power of God to save everyone that believeth, as the verse says, uh, the power of God unto salvation uh, to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And that, there's different things in the Bible that, that puzzle me for years. And you, know, you try to figure it out from faith to faith. And I've heard so many explanations. I've read so many commentaries on that. I'm thinking from faith to faith. What in the world does that mean? Well, I think I have a little bit better idea what that means now. My faith comes from who? It comes from God. God said it. It comes to me from God's word and tells me how I'm saved. But what does God tell me in his Bible that I must do to be saved? How must I act upon that salvation that he's offering me? No, 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 not walk by faith. <laughs> I'm justified by faith. Now, walking by faith is how you live. I'm say, when, I, when I shared you those two verses, I want you to know that after you're saved, then you can walk by faith, and you ought to walk by faith. But I'm just dealing with salvation here. This is what we're, Paul's talking about, us being saved, and he says uh, that uh, for therein, in the gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And I'm thinking that the idea from faith to faith is from faith, that is God giving me the message, to faith, and that's what I do is I put my faith in his message. It's his faith to me and my faith in what he says that saves me, that declares me righteous. That's why the last part of that verse says, the just shall live by faith. Today we're justified by faith, right? Faith in what? The gospel that God gave to me, from faith to to faith. God gives it to me, but I'm not saved until I believe it, and when I believe it, then I'm saved. Now, I, I want to say something clear here, Phil, um, before I take a question. This is different for us today than it was in previous ages, because in today, in the age of grace in which we live, if I, I I'll put this, God's message to me, that he is the faith that he's giving me to believe is that salvation is a free gift from him and not of works, and that if I'll believe that message, he will save me. So when I believe it, then I become saved. In past dispensations, God has said things to people that they believed, so there's a message given from God that they had to believe, but sometimes that message was, if you offer me a sin offering, I will forgive your sins. And so they weren't just saved from faith and by faith alone. They were saved by faith. There's faith there. God told them what to do. But then by faith they had to go and do what God said. Now this, that, that's different. See, that faith was always, we're going to study Hebrews 11, and Hebrews 11 is the faith chapter of the Bible, and it's where everyone understands how faith was always important to God. But some people start making a mistake when they study Hebrews chapter 11, and they start thinking that everybody was always saved by faith or through faith, and that's not true. Because God would say something to somebody, we just read the verse, by faith Abel offered a better sacrifice than Cain, a more excellent sacrifice. Why? Apparently God said, bring me a blood sacrifice, and by faith Cain went and did what he said. He acted on that faith. But his actions on that faith wasn't just believing that it was a free gift given to him freely through Christ and he just believes it and he's saved. He had to act on that faith and he had to go do it. When God gave Israel the law, and under the law there was the, the three feast days that they had to do, they couldn't just take God's word, that's faith, and say, okay, I believe that, I'm just not going to do it. No, they had to act on that. In the future age, when there's going to be a tribulation on this world, and, and the, God's message to them is that salvation will come with the second coming of Jesus Christ, and a person is now, that's God's message to them, so now they're supposed to believe that message. If they're going to believe that message, to act on that message means they will endure unto the end in order to be saved. It will be that they will pick up their cross and follow him unto death. Because that's what the Word of God is telling them to do. 
It's only in this age of grace that we're living in that God was God's faith to us. Don't do anything. You're not saved by works. You're saved by faith. You're saved not just by faith, but you're saved through faith. Hear what I have to say and believe it, and I'll save you. And, and the reason it's that way today is because of what we just expressed in the book of Ephesians. And that is that God's purpose for us is to seat us in heavenly places as a trophy of his grace. Therefore, we're saved by grace through faith and not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. To make sure that everything is excluded, you, you can never say, like we're going to read through the book of Hebrews, that by faith I offered a more excellent sacrifice. By faith I built an ark. By faith I left my land and, and moved to another land for God. Hopefully you'll learn to walk by faith, but in your salvation, in your relationship to God, you're not going to do something by faith that's going to please God and it's going to be a work. The thing that's going to please God today is you taking God at his word and believing the message of his salvation through his son. So there's a difference between by faith and through faith, and today our salvation is both through and by faith. Now, Phil, go ahead. The message that God gave, which we'll call it message. They're saved through the message that God has given them, and, and the way they acted on it is just by believing on it, and God declared him righteous. That's why we're justified by faith. Right. What? Yeah. And what I'm saying is, is it's not resident in the believer. It's resident in this book. It's resident through preaching of the gospel. Either a person is reading this book, or they're reading a book about the about Jesus Christ, or someone is telling them about Jesus Christ, and that's the faith coming to them. And it's going in their ears. Now they have to make a decision what they're going to do about that. Are they going to believe it or are they just going to ignore it? When they believe it, they've acted on that faith. No. Right. And that's exactly what he's talking about in that chapter. He's talking about all men don't have the knowledge of God to live properly. But that's because... This has to get into us. And a person who's lost, who doesn't know Jesus Christ as a Savior, it's not in them to know it. So someone else tells them about Jesus Christ, and now that's God's way of giving them faith. It's not in them, it's in their ears. Then they make a decision. Rick, Gar, Steve, go ahead. When we go through Hebrews 11, that's why I'm saying this. When you go through Hebrews 11, it's all actions there. Today, the way, the, what, how we act on the faith that God gave us is faith, okay. belief. In, in Romans, uh, where, uh, therefore we can see a man justified by faith. Right. Uh, Romans 30, let, let me let me teach my lesson and hopefully we'll get there okay I asked you to put a piece of paper there that's why come back with me to Hebrews All right. This is really simpler than I'm making it. I'm sure of it. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 11. And, uh, boy, I went the wrong way myself. Hebrews chapter 11. We've already pointed out the verses that say by faith. I want you to back up into verse in chapter 10. What led into this, the reason that chapter 11 is here, is when he was concluding in chapter 10, uh, the writer made this statement. He says, uh, he says in verse 35, cast, now I'm looking, I might have started reading too low there. Um, I'm going to start in 35, but I might miss it. It says, Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, 
after that ye have done the will of God, ye, may re ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But, but if any man draw back, my soul hath no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe, un, uh, believe to the saving of the soul. Now the writer of Hebrews is writing to these people, and he's warning them, don't draw away, that these people, they don't just believe the message and it's settled. They have to believe the message unto the coming of Christ. And if they draw back, they draw back unto what? Perdition. I say that to you because... A lot of times people point out how Hebrews uses what Paul uses two times. He uses that term justified by faith. But we're not just justified by faith, we're also saved through faith, aren't we? That's why I brought up both those terms. These people are going to be justified by faith, but they're not going to be saved through faith. And let me explain what I mean by that. They're going to go through a time of the trial of their faith. They're not going to live in the age of grace. They're going to go through a time where God's going to try their faith and there's going to be an antichrist and there's going to be a temptation for these people, the Hebrews, to go back to temple worship. And if they do, they'll be led into idolatry and the worship of the antichrist and the mark of the beast and be damned. That's why if they draw back from what verse chapter 10 has been teaching, Jesus Christ is the final sacrifice for sin, that they will be drawn back to perdition. They will be drawn away to perdition. So in the middle of that, he just throws out this statement in verse 38 but the just shall live by faith. In other words, the person who believes what God said, they will be justified by their faith because they won't draw back. They'll keep on believing unto salvation because by faith they're going to endure. Not, not, it's not a matter of through faith, just here's what God said and it's through that means that you, all, you have salvation. God is going to say something. He's going to say to them, your salvation comes at the second coming of Christ. And if you believe what I say, you will endure. And so by faith, they'll endure. That is the way that they will be justified. Now, Paul uses that to talk about us being justified by faith the moment that we believe the message. But the Hebrew writer doesn't mean it that way. He means it exactly all three times it's used in the New Testament. It's a quotation from the book of Habakkuk. And I want you to see something from Habakkuk. So go back there. That's the book right after... Nahum and before Zephaniah. So you have no problem finding it. <laughs> Just fool around back there after Daniel, uh, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk. Habakkuk. Now, now watch a survey of Habakkuk. I, now hopefully I can help you understand this, even this book. This is quite interesting what Habakkuk's going through. And if you understand it from the Jewish point of view, not that they live in the age of grace, but that these people, their temple is going away, they're going to be overrun with Gentiles, they're going to have to endure to the end, they ha can't take the mark of the beast, they can't follow the Antichrist, and if they'll do that by faith, then they will be saved when Jesus Christ returns. Now that's the message of Habakkuk. Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 1 says this, it says, The burden which Habakkuk, the prophet, did see, O Lord, how long shall I cry, and thou wilt not hear? even cry out unto thee in uh, of violence, and thou wilt not save. Why dost thou show me uh, iniquity, and cause me to behold grievousness, grievance? Uh, for spoiling and violence are before me, and there are, the, and, and there are that rise up strife and contention. Therefore the law is slack, and judgment doth never go forth. For the wicked doth compass about the righteous, Therefore, wrong, uh, wrong judgment uh, proceedeth. So he sees nothing but evil taking over, and he's calling out to the Lord, and the Lord's not doing nothing about it. So Habakkuk, as he's looking at this, he, he, he can't understand some things, and God's going to respond to him in verse 5. It, in, in, uh, in verse 5 it says, Behold ye among the heathen, and regard, and wonder marvelously. For I work a work in your days, which ye will not believe, though, um, though it be told you. For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and, hast and hasty nation, which shall march through the, the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. 
In other words, Habakkuk, you think you see some bad things now? You're about to see some things you're not going to believe, but I'm going to tell you. I'm going to let Nebuchadnezzar and his army of the Chaldeans march right through Jerusalem and take it over. Now, <laughs> he's going for, he thought things were bad already. Now they're going to get worse. Gentiles are going to conquer them. So he, he, he's having, God said you won't believe it, though I'll tell you. And so he's having a hard time understanding. Look down to verse 12. <laughs> Look at Habakkuk's statement back to God. He said, Art thou not from everlasting, <laughs> O Lord, my God, my Holy One? <laughs> and I'm counting on you to be holy, God. <laughs> we shall not die. O Lord, thou hast ordained them for judgment. And O uh, Almighty God, uh, thou hast established them for correction. Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. Wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devoureth a man that is more righteous than he. <laughs> Lord, I don't quite understand what you're going to do. This doesn't sound righteous. I mean, we might be bad, but the Gentiles are evil. And you're going to judge, you're going to let the Gentiles destroy people more righteous than them? So Habakkuk can't understand why God is going to do the things he's going to do. And, and so he's kind of questioning God. Look at verse, chapter 2, verse 1. He said, I will stand upon the watch, and I will set me upon the tower, and will watch to see what he will say unto me, and what I will answer when I am reproved. So we'll, he's going to wait for an answer from God, so for God to explain to him what's going on here. So it says in verse 2, the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision, and make it plain upon tables, that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. But at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, uh, it will surely come, it will not tarry. Now, now catch these words. It sounds like it's a long way off, doesn't it? But the whole thing is, tarry for it. Wait for it to be completed. When it's completed, it'll be done, but you're going to have to wait for it. So that idea of tarrying till it's completed. Verse 4 says, Behold, his soul, which is lifted up, is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Now, there's something that's coming ahead. Now, we're into prophecy here. Something is coming ahead, and, and when it's all done, God's word will stand. So don't believe, don't think that God's word won't come true, but you better make sure you tarry. In other words, don't come short, don't draw back, go all the way through, tarry, endure to the end, and you'll see it. And, and then all of a sudden it begins to talk about a he in verse 4. His soul is not upright in him. And then it turns around and talks about another group of people, I believe. It says, but the just shall live by his faith. A person who is just will live by his faith. Why? Because what God told him in verse 3 is tarry. And a person who believes what God said is going to tarry and wait till it's all over. And then you'll see... God's remedy in the whole thing. Now, the he that, that heart is not upright in him, look at the next verse and see if we can't figure out who this guy is. It says, Yea, also, because he transgresseth my, name, my wine, he is uh, a proud man, neither keepeth uh, at home, who enlargeth his, uh, his desire as hell, and is as death, and cannot be satisfied that gathereth unto him all nations, and heapeth unto him all people. Who would you think that is? Yeah, it sounds like there's going to be an Antichrist whose heart's not upright in him. He's going to try to draw everybody to him. Look down in verse 12, uh, verse 18. Can your question hold, Dave? Okay, let me just go then. Verse, verse 18 says, concerning the same man, it says, What profiteth the graven image, that the maker thereof hath graven it, the molten image, and the teacher of lies, that the maker of it that maketh uh, trusteth therein to make dumb idols? Who unto him, and that is idols that can't talk, who unto him that, uh, him that said to the, to the wood, Awake, and to the dumb stone, Arise, it teach, uh, it shall teach. Behold, it is laid over with gold and silver, and there is no breath at all in the midst of it. But the Lord is in his holy temple, will let all, let all the earth keep silent before him. 
So this guy introduces idolatry, an idol that's going to teach, right? Well, that's, that's Antichrist. He's going to put an image in the temple. There is an uh, image. That's, that's what that mark of the beast is all about. And, and, and so the Lord is in his holy temple. God's still in control, even though this person is, seems to be taken over. So you get that to chapter 3, and it says in verse 1, it says, The prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, uh, unto uh, Shignoth, <laughs> the Lord, uh, the, O Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, receive thy, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make known. In wrath, remember mercy. In the midst of what years? You got seven years of tribulation right in the middle is when the Antichrist puts that, that temple, uh, that, that image in that temple. That's when the nation of Israel is going to come to faith. And the just shall live by faith. What are they going to do? Flee into the mountains like, you, like they're told. So, so this is talking about in the midst of the years, those years that are to come. Now, you want to look at something interesting. I think you can learn the direction that Jesus Christ's second coming will take. Verse 3 says, God cometh from Teman, and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. His glory covereth the heavens, and the earth was filled with his, full of his praise. And his righteousness was as the light. He had horns coming out of his hand, and there uh, was the hiding of his power. Before him went the pestilence, and burning coals went forth uh, at his feet. Uh, he stood, and he measured, and you see him coming. Look down in verse 10. It says, The mountains saw thee, and, and they trembled. The overflowing of the waters passed by. The deep uttereth his voice, and lifted up his hands on high. The sun and the moon stood still in their habitation at, at the light of thine arrows that went went and, and at the shining of thy glittering spear. Thou didst march through the land in indignation. Thou didst thresh the heathen in anger. Thou wentest forth for the salvation of thy people, even for the salvation of thine anointed. Thou woundest the head out of the house of the wicked by discovering the fountains unto the neck. Selah. Now, isn't that Jesus Christ coming back? And what does he ultimately do? Saves the nation of Israel. Habakkuk can't see. What? God, I can't see you being judgment. Israel is bad, but you're going to let Babylon come through and wipe us out. I, I can't understand this. God says to Habakkuk, don't worry about it. Let me, let me help you understand something. And that is, you're going to see some things. and some. I'm going to let Babylon come through and wipe you out. But remember, tarry till it's over. The just will live by faith. So here comes this Antichrist. He's going to do all these cruel things. It looks like he's winning, drawing all the nations unto him. But then the Lord comes. And in his indignation, he comes through the land, and he devours the land, and he destroys the enemy, and he saves the nation of Israel. And that's when they're going to be saved. When Habakkuk says the just shall live by faith, it's not just believe the gospel of Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. The message that Habakkuk is saying is don't fall away when this man of sin, when you see evil taking over the world and you can't figure out what God is doing, you just wait. You tarry in faith till God comes through and brings the ultimate salvation that he's promised. That is being justified by faith in the book of Hebrews. That's the message of the Hebrew people. That's why when you're going to go all the way through chapter 11, it's by faith they did this, by faith they did that, by faith they did the other, because what, he, the, nation, what the book of Hebrews is telling the nation of Israel is that they're going to have to be justified by their faith. God will save Israel at the second coming of Christ. Until then, don't let your soul draw back unto perdition, but believe unto the saving of your soul. Now that's the message of the kingdom. It's the message of the, uh, of, of the prophetic program. But what's God's message for us today? It's the message of the cross. And by the cross, we're saved the moment we believe the message. We're not going to shall be saved. We are saved when we believe the message. And that's why Paul, when he quotes that verse, he says, from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Today, God's message to us is not a message of some great temptation coming that we got to overcome. God's message to us is that Jesus Christ already paid the full work of our sins on the cross. When you believe it, I'll declare you righteous and give you right then everlasting life as a free gift because I want to magnify my grace in the heavenly places in the ages to come.
Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay. Be thankful. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you for we thank you for this opportunity to share these truths, and we do pray, Lord, that uh, that there was some understanding and uh, and that we didn't confuse things. But Father, there is two different programs, and and how clear it is that some people's faith is going to have to carry them through to salvation, and some of us get saved in this age of grace. All of us get saved the moment we believe the gospel because it's your gift to us. It's the magnification of your grace. We thank you that we live in such a time and pray that as we learn more about that, that we will uh, live it in our life, show it, uh, appreciate it in our heart, and uh, and speak of it often. Uh, we thank you now for this time again. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.